Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 44th meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Triangulate Categories. Today, our speaker is David Barnes from Queen's University, Belfast, and uh, he'll be speaking to us about sheaf models for rational stable equivariant and group theory. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the chance to speak and the, the pleasure to be here, as it were. Okay, so I'm going to talk through some work. Um, certain amount of this was done by my PhD student, Danny Sagru. Um, and then uh, I've been following up on some of that. So we're going to start with a bit of motivation. Uh, then in the middle, we'll get down to something fairly gentle and explain some things, and at the end, maybe speed up again. Okay. So what is our starting point? Our starting point is topological spaces with an action of a topological group G up to homotopies that preserve those group actions. So that's your notion of, state of unstable equivariant homotopy theory. We're all fairly familiar with it. And you know, lots of topological spaces, manifolds, objects that we encounter have got symmetries. Those symmetries are including a group action, so it makes sense. Okay, so you go away and you develop some unstable equivariant homotopy theory and you notice that there is uh, an equivariant forward into a suspension theorem. It's a bit harder to state, so I've not really tried properly. The key point is that uh, this map, which is the suspension by V, or if you prefer, take V your representation, take its one point compactification, do smash with that. Um, under certain conditions of the dimension of the H fixed points of X, the H fixed points of Y, and the H fixed points of V, but all varying H, if that condition is met, which is a bit like the original uh, Fontaine suspension theorem, then you get that this map here is an isomorphism. So you start to say, okay, so there's some stable behavior, all right. Equally, you could say, well, let's go look at some equivariant cohomology theories, right? Um, what could you do? Well, if you've got an ordinary cohomology theory E star, you could define a new one by taking this uh, Borel construction. You could take uh, equivariant K theory, and maybe you would like to take uh, an equivariant uh, cobordism. And so all of these examples exist, and you start to say, okay, there's useful equivariant cohomology theories. And the key point is that rather than just taking the cohomology theory on a G space and then a G act on the resulting um, cohomology groups, instead you want to use that cohomology, that group action right in the start. Right? And you see that for sort of equivariant K theory and equivariant cohomology. Well, you get a Brown representability theorem in the equivariant setting. And they're represented by these things called equivariant spectra, which you can construct um, if you spend enough time looking at spectra and thinking about how you want to do those things. Great. So we get equivariant cohomology theories. We get avoidance of suspension theorem. They're related to each other. You can make an equivariant Spanier Whitehead category. You keep going through all this and you can recreate all of the um, stable homotopy theory, but now with extra group action. And then you think to yourself, well, this is going to be complicated. I mean, normal stable homotopy theory is pretty tough, pretty tough to calculate in. With a group action, it's going to be even harder. So to make things a bit easier, you say, well, let's look at the rational case. Right? Um, in this case, I'm just going to say rational equivariant spectra are those things which represent rational equivariant cohomology theories. And that's just a cohomology theory, an equivariant cohomology theory that takes values in Q matrix. So, if you've got F star, some ordinary equivariant cohomology theory, you could just take F star of blank tensor Q to make a rational one. So it's easy enough to make rational ones. There's plenty of them. I could just rationalize any of these. And what we're doing here is we're moving most of that topological complexity. And the key part is that a lot of the interesting equivariant behavior remains. Um, so you get things like rational Burnside rings appearing, uh, representation rings occurring, but you've got rid of all that really difficult torsion information. Okay, so I'm going to pretend that everyone has been thoroughly motivated on 
the concept of rational equivalent stable Hartzog theory, and now everyone's desperate to learn some more. Okay. Well, assuming you do want to learn some more, you say to yourself, I don't want to have to learn everything about all of the spectra that are involved. I want to cut to sort of a nice homotopy theory that's got the same information. How can I get there sort of quickly? The answer is this notion of equivariant models. And so encapsulated by this theorem here, proven by Greenlees and May in, I think, 92 is when it was published. Um, rational G spectra up to homotopy are equivalent to the derived category of these group rings. So we're taking this normalizer, quotient by height, taking the rational group ring, and then taking the product of all of these things over the conjugacy classes of subgroups of G. And if you don't like derived categories, you could say, oh, it's these chain complexes of modules over this thing. And then we just take the product and then we take the homotopy category. Okay, so far so good. Um, <clears throat> and you say, well, is that a homotopy equivalence? Is there more structure to it? And the answer is that yes, there is, because we can in fact phrase this in terms of the Quinn equivalence. And once you've got it phrased in terms of Quinn equivalence, you've then got questions, well, is it monoidal? And that kind of thing was answered. The, the Quinn equivalence case was done by Schrader and Shipley, and then the questions of one identity answered by myself and Magdalene and Jurek, and then later Christian and Wimmer looking at some commutative monoidal structures and so on and so forth. And um, rather than having to work in this sort of complicated topological category, which you can define quite carefully, you can work in this much simpler thing, category over here, this algebra. And it really is simpler because you already know a bunch of examples. I mean, you, you know what WGH is, you could look at the free uh, group ring, you could look at just the fixed one, Q of modules, and then you just take various products of these. Uh, very easy to make uh, a bunch of examples. Okay. So that's the finite case, right? And now we want to ask, what about uh, more general cases? Well, there's all kinds of results in the compact leap group case, and I'm going to leave that over to one side, what I'm going to worry about are profinite groups. So what does a profinite group G is profinite if it is compact, is reasonable, we often want that in a group, Hausdorff, of course we want that for a topological group, and totally disconnected. Totally disconnected means that the connected component of any point is just the singleton set of that point. Okay, and this is equivalent to G being the limit of GI, where this is some ordered system of finite groups. And that's where we say sort of pro-finite. I've got a bunch of finite groups, I've got a bunch of group called morphings between them. It's got this, this filtered property. And I just take the limit of all these things and I get a profinite group. So it's a good way of saying, I don't really want profinite groups, I, want, I don't want finite groups, but I want something that's like a system of finite groups. And I'm going to bundle it all together to get this group G. And the standard examples, I mean, I'm just going to say the periodic integers, all finite groups. And then if you also want, you can say, well, uh, the Morales stabilizer group is profinite. Gower groups of field extensions, or Gower groups of Gower extensions, I think, are profinite. And the entire fundamental groups of algebraic geometry are, are all profinite. So you get a whole bunch of uh, examples coming from various places. So it makes sense to worry about this kind of group. What's the analog of this theorem in the case of profinite groups? Well, that was proven by Danny back in 2019-ish. And we've got the main result here. So what I want to do in this talk, I want to explain a bit about this result and some things that are related to it. What should you take away at the moment? Well, G spectra Q, this is the thing that we're interested in. It's a category of rational G spectrum. There's rich information coming from the G equivariant, stable homotopy uh, structures. You might ask, well, is this a model category? You say, yes. 
It's a model category and it has weak equivalences given by homotopy groups where we're taking H homotopy groups for all open subgroups of G, right? Not just all closed subgroups, but open subgroups. And you might want to, you might find that strange, but you might also say, oh, I know what an open subgroup of a profinite group is. Subgroup of a profinite group is open if and only if it is uh, closed and a finite index, which kind of makes sense given how G is the limit of the GI. And so, what should you take away from this result? There's a cool equivalence. What's this side? Well, we've got some chain complexes. We've got this notion of a vile G sheaf. So it's a kind of equivariant sheaf, a special class. Uh, we're taking equivariant sheaves of rational uh, in Q modules. And then the other thing is what's this term thing here? This here is the space of closed subgroups of G. And one might ask, well, why does this thing crop up? And one answer is that if we were to take the rational Burnside ring of G, this thing here is isomorphic to continuous maps from the space of closed subgroups of G into the rationals, and they should be G equivariant, so closed under conjugacy. <coughs> so, Sort of, it makes sense to expect the space of closed subgroups to crop up in here because uh, the Burns algorithm is fundamental to equivalent stable homotopy theory. Okay, so we've got an idea of what the sort of the result is. Here's this thing we're interested in. Here's this much simpler category. And I'm going to try to sell people a little bit on how exciting and useful sheaves are. You might want to say, well, okay, how would I go about proving this result? And I would say there's two steps to it. The first step is this theory of tilters of Schrader and Shipley. And that gets you from sort of G spectra to topological Mackey functors. You tidy up the topological Mackey functors a little bit, and you end up in chain complex to Mackey functors. And then we apply this equivalence, which says that Mackey functors rationally are the same thing as this special category of equivalent sheaves. Okay. Um, one of the things that you might say is, well, why don't you just stop at Mackey functors? And that's going to be the second half of the talk, which is where I'm going to try and say that sheen is more interesting because it allows us to calculate some things like injective dimensions. Um, just one thing that we could say now is um, what would happen in this equivalence? Well, I mentioned the rational Burnside ring, and you get the Burnside ring Mackey functor. Okay, you know what a Mackey functor is, you're perfectly happy with the Burnside ring Mackey functor. Of course, we want the rational one. What is that sent to? It's sent to the constant sheaf Q, which I find quite satisfying. I mean, on the one hand, you've got the most interesting thing of the Mackey functors, and over here, you've got the nicest sort of sheaf, and the constant sheaf is in particular an example of a biology sheaf. On the other hand, uh, if I were to take, I mean, there's a thing here that you could call the skyscraper sheaf at the trivial subgroup of some A, where A is a Q module. I shouldn't use A because I've already used A, so I'm going to say B. B is a Q module. Um, so this is a very common sheaf that one could imagine. What does this correspond to? It corresponds to the Mackey functor, which at M of H, it is. Of H. So it's like this fixed point Mackey functor. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the main result. Um, and the sub result telling us uh, that Mackey functors are large issues. And there's a slogan here I want to try to sell people on, which is um, equivariant sheaves, so at least rationally, generalize Mackey functors. So if you've got something that's looking a bit like a Mackey functor, but isn't one precisely, Maybe it's some kind of equivariant sheaf over some uh, profile G space. Okay, let's move on to uh, a couple of the more sort of end results of this kind of thing. Um, there was a result uh, with a little bit back of the envelope, but we're pretty sure that it works. 
you might say, well, what is this category of rational G spectra that you're making? I don't think rational here is relevant. I think it's probably works without the assumption you're rational. So, well, is that related to sort of this diagram of G of the spectra? <laughs> Hello? Could you say a word of the topology of S of G? How, how is S of G a, a topological space? Yes, it is. Um, S of G is the limit over N of S of G mod N. So G mod N is going to be a finite group. This N is an open normal subgroup of G. Um, so now this thing here, this space of subgroups of S of G mod N, that is just a, a finite discrete space. And then you might ask what the map is, and you send H to uh, HN mod N, and this is supposed to be a sequence, so we let N vary. So uh, SG is topologized as this limit, so you could say, well, it's the, whatever it is, the, the, the best topology that makes these map continuous. Um, jumping back to this result, you could take all of these categories of G mod N spectra, and you could say, well, there's inflation maps relating them, or you could say there's fixed points map relating them. If you take the limit over the fixed points or the co-limit over the inflation functors, you get back rational G spectra. And for that to make sense, one of course needs to say stable infinity category, because that's not the kind of thing you really want to do in model category language. What's amusing is that there's an algebraic version of this. Um, I mean, this result is telling you that G spectra really is the limit of G mod N spectra, which that's what it should be, right? You've got all these G mod N spectra, you've got something in each one, but they're all compatible. What is that information? It's a G spectrum. Uh, there's a relation here. Um, this works with a vial, it also works without vial, so I'm going to cross it out. If you take G sheaves over the space of subgroups, you can write a G sheaf over the space of subgroups as a co-limit of G mod N sheaves over these finite spaces. So this kind of gives you a way to build uh, a G sheaf over SG in sort of finite data. Because I mean, this here is just an equivariant sheaf over a finite discrete space. So it's very trivial information, it's very algebraic. Um, and I just put this here as an algebraic equivalent of this statement here, which is really telling you what G spectra are. Okay. Equivariant sheaves, a reminder, just in case maybe people um, want to take something away from this talk, uh, a bit more basic. So there's a couple of definitions. Uh, my preferred one is G sheaf over G space X. It's a local homeomorphism of G spaces and that the projection map commutes with the G action. And we often just call this as saying that P is equivariant. So uh, what's a local homeomorphism? I'm saying that each point of E has an open neighborhood such that P restricted to that open neighborhood is a homeomorphism onto its image, just like we have with ordinary sheets. <clears throat> uh, there's another definition in terms of pullback sheets with this cosine of unit condition. Uh, the two definitions are entirely equivalent. Um, I prefer this one, um, other people prefer the other. The, my complaint about the other one is that in order for it to make sense, you have to first define pullback sheaves and everything. And you can kind of lose the fact that you're taking this pullback sheaf, which is actually kind of a, an involved construction. So then um, we should have an example. And at this stage, I'm only gonna give the most boring example. Um, let's take A. A discrete G space. So, you know, a set with a G action that's continuous and so on and so forth. So, the discrete topology on A and the constant sheaf at A is just the projection from A cross X onto X. Okay. So, I mean, Pretty trivial and you say well does a have to be discrete and the answer is yes because when you look through the terminology um, what you get to check is that the stalks which you could define as the pre-image of p or this co-limit 
these are always going to be discrete. And that discreteness is a consequence of this local homeomorphism condition. So why do we call these sheaves? It's the so-called aggregate terminology. You've got a stalk of something like wheat, a bunch of stalks put together as a sheaf, and then a bit of a stalk is then just a straightforward germ. And one of the things you might say is, well, do you want your sections, so your continuous maps going in the sort of the wrong direction, do you want them to be equivariant? And the answer is no. We do not ask for them to be equivariant. We definitely want to include non-equivariant sections. That's kind of the key point. And you know, some of the structure theorems that we get later on make use of them. So ordinary sheaves, but there's also a group action. Um, <clears throat> makes it slightly harder to come up with the simple examples. Unless we work in a nice context. So that nice context is when the base space and the group are going to be profinite. So quick reminder, told you this profinite, this compact house to be totally disconnected. And um, reminder, we've got SG is the limit over the open normal subgroups of G of SG mod N. So this space of subgroups, the space of closed subgroups, right? Um, is a profinite space. And in particular, we'll see the space of the p-adics on the next page. Um, in terms of groups, well, you've got a nicer condition in terms of the open normal subgroups. G is profinite if and only if it's isomorphic to this particular limit here, which, I mean, this is a subset of just the product of the G mod ends. And, and you can see that this product here, I mean, it has to be compact, it has to be housed, or in particular, it's going to be totally disconnected. So, so is this thing over here. Okay, um, I gave the definition of the SG earlier. Um, and we're going to want to restrict ourselves to the case where uh, the space X, the base space of our sheaves, is profinite, and where our group is profinite. Let's move on. Um, what is the space of subgroups of the p addicts? I mean, it looks like this. So, I mean, this here I'm imagining as a subset just of the real line. Uh, this here is the subgroup, the whole group. This here is p times the p addicts. This here is p squared times the p addicts. Dot, dot, dot. And then this last one here is the trivial group. What you see is that the trivial group as a point is the limit of the p to the ends which kind of makes sense. It sort of morally, it's sort of very satisfying that that's true. On the other hand, you could say, well, well, what about some other spaces of subgroups? Well, if we take P and Q primes not equal, the space of subgroups is sort of like the, the product of this with itself. So uh, one of these directions is P, the other is Q, and you get this sort of big, uh, so here, a whole bunch of discrete spaces, so it's a whole bunch of not discrete, isolated points. You then get all of these points along here are limits of the others. And then this point here in the bottom left hand corner, which I mean, this really is the trivial group again, this is like a limit of limit points. And this here would be something like E cross P Z P. And then this point over here would be something like uh, Z Q cross E. I've got P and Q switched around. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so these things are fairly nice. Um, on the other hand, if you take ZP hat to the N, this is now, where's the spelling of this thing? The Dalchinsky space. And I need some accents. I need a little cross through the L and then a tap on the N. There we go. So it doesn't matter. Uh, this is for N strictly greater than one. And this is one of these famous sort of um, pathological spaces. So this is true for N equals two and N equals three. They're all the same space. 
and they're very, very poorly behaved pathological constructions. Okay, so we've got this space of subgroups, and that's the one of most interest to me, and it kind of crops up because um, it's the thing that you use to, def it's one way to define the rational Burnside ring. Um, or I should say again, a of G, the rational Burnside ring, that is tensor by Q. It is continuous functions from the space of closed subgroups into the rationals. You can also define it as the covenant over N. And you get to choose which of these you take as a definition, which of these you take as a theorem. So the space of subgroups is important, it crops up. Let's move on. Okay, so <clears throat> you want to work with equivariant sheaves? Well, we know how to work with sheaves, and one of the things that we do with sheaves is we use sheafification, right? It's a great way to produce a sheaf. I defined for you uh, a notion of a pre-sheaf, this kind of algebraic construction, and I say, well, if you want a sheaf out of this, you take the corresponding sheaf space, you do this thing called sheafification. Well, when you try to do this uh, for equivariant sheaves, you run into a bit of a problem, which is how would you define an equivariant pre sheaf? What would you use? And how are you going to make sure that the corresponding sheaf space that you're going to build has a continuous action of the group? And uh, I mean, to me, this is sort of the real difficulty with equivariant sheaves that at all points you need this continuity, but you also want to work with the algebraic data. And in the case where G and X are profinite, there's a very nice solution to this that I worked out following on from some of Danny's work, and that we get a good notion of equivariant pre-sheaves and a good notion of equivariant sheafification, and everything that gets down to the non-equivariant constructions. Okay, so what's the basic idea? Basic idea is the following. Instead of taking the category of open subsets of X, Let's take the category of compact open subsets. That's fine, X is profile, it has a compact open basis. And for morphisms, instead of just taking the inclusions of open subgroups, I'm gonna take inclusions and translations together. Right? So it's not U is inside V, it's that some translation of U is inside V. And key point is that I'm gonna take this thing as a set. You could say, oh, well, that's not a set. That's obviously got a topology on it. Yeah, good. And then you could worry about defining equivariant sheaves in terms of topologically enriched functors. And that's going to get really complicated. And you're going to have to worry about all the constructions preserving this. We don't need any of that. I just take this thing as a set. I define a functor from here to sets. This could be for abelian groups, or this could be R modules. It's all going to be the same. It's all going to give me a good notion. But the magic that we used is that we asked that the action of the stabilizer group on F of U is discrete. And this is this algebraic condition which gives you the topological property that when I take the sheaf space of this construction, just the ordinary sheaf space, you're going to be able to define a group action on it because of this definition. And that group action is going to be continuous because of this thing. So an easily checkable algebraic condition it gives you the difficult topological property. And uh, in order for this to work, you really do need X to be profinite and you really do need G to be profinite. If you try this with compact many groups, it's going to give a wildly different answer. And I think in fact, it's going to be false, but it's difficult to prove such a statement. One thing you might ask is, well, does every G equivariant sheaf define one of these things? Well, it's clear that you're going to get this kind of, uh, you're going to be able to forget down to a functor on this category because you've clearly got inclusions and the G equivariant sheaf behavior is going to give you these translations, this uh, functors from F of U to F of G U or F of G U to U, you can worry about contravariance. Um, but there's a key property which is if S from U to E is a section 
of a G sheath B from E to X. Then there is a subgroup H of G open and a V inside U. So that when I restrict S to V, this section, it is H equivariant. So you don't ask that all your sections be equivariant for the whole group, but if you give me any section, I should say U open plus compact, I can restrict it to a section which isn't equivariant for the whole group, and it's only on a part of the original U, but it's H equivariant. And we call this thing local sub equivariance. It's not locally equivariant, it's local equivariant. There are subgroups, so hence locally sub equivariance. And um, while it's not too visible from what I've written here, this property here, this local sub equivariance, implies this condition. Just one more thing. You might say, well, this checking this action is going to be discrete. That looks like a pain. I'm going to have to go think carefully and check with this continuity. It's actually really easy. Uh, it is discrete if and only if when you take all of these terms, all these fixed points for n and open normal subgroup in G, and you map this into f of u, this should be an isomorphism. So this discreteness condition here is equivalent to this map, this canonical map induced by the inclusions of fixed points being an isomorphism. And if you go and read the various books, um, Griezmann, Zaleski and Wilson and so on and so forth, you see that whenever they're talking about, uh, I guess, the, the theory of topological groups and sort of representations, discrete modules are the things that come up all the time. So there's a whole theory of these discrete modules and they're rather the well behaved. And sort of that's what we're tapping into. Okay, so if nothing else, take away equivariant sheaves uh, as a lovely theory when you assume that the base space and total space are profinite. Okay, so now we come back to the, the result. We've seen what S of G is, we know what a G sheaf is. What is this vial condition? I take A G sheaf is vile if, now you can look at the stalk of H because H is in SG, right? And the stabilizer in SG of H acts on the stalk and the stabilizer, because G acts on the space of by conjugation, uh, is the normalizer. So this, Stalk has an action of the normalizer group. Let's ask that it is H fixed. So the NGH action is a WGH or NGH mod H action. So instead of creating actions by the normalizers, you get actions by the vial groups, and hence we call it a vial G sheet. Okay. <clears throat> so now we know what a VAR G sheaf is. It's a perfect nice category. There's a functor from G sheaves to VAR G sheaves where you just take uh, the H fixed points at each stalk over H. Um, and it's very well related. So we get a nice category over here. I take chain complexes and such things. I can take the standard model structure of chain complexes and I get the equivalence to rational G spectra. So this is a nice algebraic model. Um, it covers finite case. So if G is finite, then it's to a profinite and you can check these VAR G sheaves over SG. It's exactly this product of W2H modules back from the old result of mode. Okay, um, 
I guess I just want to get a couple of examples of Varji sheaves. You can make any G sheave into a Varji sheave, as I've said, but uh, let V be a discrete G module. Um, so these are rational vector space. It's got a continuous action of the group G, which you can check by saying that the various fixed points of V, when you combine them all together as a co-limit, that's just V. Or if you like, you can describe it as saying that the stabilizer of any point of V is going to be an open subgroup. There is a well, sheaf whose stalk at K in space of glass subgroups is V to the K. So you kind of got like this fixed point sheaf. I just take any discrete G module and I can make something with all of these stalks. It's a bit harder to describe what the uh, sets, what the value is in terms of the open sets, what the sections are in general. But in this case, we get a very nice description of the stalks. And, um, you know, you want to build this using machine. You don't want to go check this by hand and sort of worry about what's the continuity going to be. And we've got machinery that will do that. Another example, one that's going to come in handy in a little bit. Let's take a, a Q module. Okay, so just a rational vector space with this group topology if we need to topologize it. And with stabilize it in G, that's no action. Then we're going to ask that this action be discrete, so, or if you like, continuous. And <clears throat> I'll make this into a sheaf over a general space X. So what do I do? I take O. I'm going to extend it over its orbit by taking the stabilizer in G of X naught. This is for X naught in X G space. So G is going to be a profile X. A, it's going to be a profile G space. So I take this thing. And then we take the co-product over the orbit of x naught with x. And this is what we're going to call the skyscraper at x naught of O. Okay. And you might say, well, I've seen skyscraper shears before. They're supposed to have exactly one non-zero stalk. We say, yep. Yeah. And yet the variant case, you can't quite do it like that because of course the stalks all the stalks in an orbit all have to be isomorphic. So instead, we ask that this sheaf uh, be constructed like this, and it's now got um, exactly one orbit where the stalks are non-zero and all the other stalks are zero. So this is the equivariant skyscraper sheaf. Why do we care about these? We care about these because um, we can actually show that uh, A is always going to be injective in this category of modules. And that in fact, the skyscraper sheaf is going to be uh, injective rational G sheaf over X. So not only is it injective, in fact, we can prove that this is going to be enough injectives. So, Uh, I guess I should write that down. Proposition skyscraper at x naught of a is injective, and these give enough injectives. I mean, having got an algebraic model, why not look at the homological dimension? How homologically complicated is this thing? If I'm going to make some extra roots, how far down the X do I have to move? Uh, eventually, I'm going to want to make an admin spectral sequence relating rational G spectra to this algebraic model. Well, how many pages do I have to go along until that collapses? And that's normally determined by the injective dimension of the category. Um, so it makes sense to get that. And we've got these skyscrapers, and they give us all the injectives. And then 
we can do uh, the following the e the rational g sheaf over a profile space x the equivariant Godemore resolution Now, there's this thing called the Godemore resolution. It's like a stalkwise res resolution of uh, generally sheaves of R modules. You can generalize this to the equivariant setting. And instead of taking um, ordinary skyscrapers, I have to take equivariant skyscrapers. So I know is really just a product of these equivariant skyscrapers in a particular way. Um, and we get a perfectly good resolution. And we get a little lemma which says if x in x is isolated, then y1 stalker x is zero. And that's the kind of basic observation. So, all right, that's nice. So, isolated points, their stalk only survives to place one. But then you say, well, what about? The limit points of isolated points, do they, how long do they survive? And so we've got a little bit of a process that we can write down. Okay. So let x prime be x exclude its isolated points. Okay. And just inductively, we're going to have x not be x. And xn be xn minus one with its isolated points removed. Uh, in case you've seen something like this before, there's lots of choices of notation and they seem uh, already in the literature conflicting. So don't worry, it's whatever process you think it is. Um, I'm just using this notation. Okay. And we get another result which says if x is removed, at stage n. So I'm doing this process, repeatedly removing these points. And uh, at point n, place n, I remove x, but not before. Then my n of x equals zero. And that's just like the, the nth case of this first one. So the set prevent go to more resolution, you can start to see that it's gonna sort of peter out if eventually every point becomes removed by repeating this process. Yeah. Good. That process is this thing called Cantor ben, the Cantor Ben Dixon process now. And it gives you this thing called the Cantor Ben Dixon rank of your G space X. And uh, putting together uh, that sort of result gives you an upper bound. You can then calculate using the constant sheaf and you get this result of Danny, which uh, take a profinite G space and G itself is going to be profinite. Add in this condition on uh, neighborhood basis, which is true for the space of subgroups. Then if X is such that after N stages, you get the empty set, at the, not after n minus one stages, then the injective dimension of G sheaves is n minus one. On the other hand, if it never ends up the same thing, then the injective dimension is infinite. So what we're able to do here is connect directly from uh, this, this cantabinics and process, this idea of which points are isolated to the injective dimension. So a quick example, if you remember G as the P addix, S of ZP is this space with exactly one limit point. This thing has injective dimension one. On the other hand, if you take ZP cross ZQ hat, you get injective dimension Two. Okay. okay. 
So to me, this is pretty cool um, because you get this property of the space of subgroups, uh, this thing called the Candomba Dixon rank, which people have studied, and it connects all the way back to the injected dimension of the original category. And one of the reasons I find this quite satisfying is I tried to see if I could find how you would capture the injected dimension of categories of Mackey functors, and I didn't really see any particular answer. And if we can, can I mean, this connects it to this kind of prediction rank. So whatever you do with Mackey functors has to be at least as complicated as this. Since this is a known process, at least for certain groups, the models will go up and do it. Um, there is a kind of hidden option in here in that you can end up with spaces which after uh, finitely many stages repeat as a non-zero space at each time. And we've, we've struggled to sort of get what's going on there. We think the answer is going to be infinite injected dimension. We think the only case it's going to be finite is um, <clears throat> in this case. And there's all kinds of complicated things with this kind of prediction rank where you might like to sort of say, well, actually I want a transfinite process. I don't just want to do it, do this removal of isolated points finitely. many times I want to move past uh, ordinals and cardinals. Um, I, I leave that to, to, to to the experts, because we only want finite injected dimension. Okay, so in that big theorem, rational Mac, rational G spectra, we get all the way down to sheaves. Sheaves is a perfect nice category. We've got some interesting examples. It gives us a notion of what's going on with the injected dimension. And uh, we also get this sort of uh, very clear appearance of this space of closed subject. One last thing I want to do, and maybe I'll just take a few minutes, is how does this equivalence between Mackey functors and Vargin sheaves go? Well, I can assume that everyone knows what a Mackey functor is. Okay, so if I have a Vargin sheaf here, I send E to a Mackey functor M, which at MH is the space of sections from the space of subgroups of H into E, continuous sections, and I want in particular H equivariant sections. So H equivariant sections over the space of subgroups of H. So given a bar G sheaf E, this is my values. Uh, conjugation, is induced by group actions. I'm not saying a bit more than that. Um, I can sit there and try and guess what it is. Restriction is restriction of sections, which is quite satisfying. It's a very much a restriction functor. And what is the induction functor for this Mackey functor? Well, in this case, <clears throat> it's given by sum over a traversal and extension by zero. So that's a little bit vague, but basically I'm saying um, you take your section. Well, you've got a section, you want to make it a section over a larger subgroup. So let's just take all of the traversal of one subgroup in the other, move all those sections around, add them all up, and then everywhere else we just extend by zero. Um, just in terms of the other way around, uh, if I had an, a Mackey functor M, what would M map to? It would map to a sheaf with stalk at in space of closed subgroups. And it's going to be the following thing. It's going to be this colimit. Now, the Mackey functors here, I've not said this, but when one's defining a Mackey functor for a profinite group, these only take values that open subgroups of G. So each MNK 
This is now going to be an open subgroup because I'm going to take n to be an open minor subgroup of G. Like I can't take the value of m at k, it doesn't make any sense. So instead I take this co-limit, but I don't just quite want this co-limit. I have to stick in some idempotents, which is a bit difficult to define. The point is it's sort of a co-limit of these values, and this gives me a stalk description. And in some ways you get what you'd expect. From the Mackey function to a sheaf, I can tell you what the stalks are, but not so much the sections. Going from a sheaf to a Mackey functor, I'm going to define it in terms of sections, and I'm not really going to use stalks. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think I'm going to finish there. Uh, thank you, David. Let me just, yeah. Can we all unmute ourselves and give David a round of applause? Okay, if you have any questions for the speaker, please ask them now. Does it, does it play any role in your work that for finite group Mackey functors over Q are semi-simple? Um, yeah, I think, I think that corresponds to just saying that when you're looking at the sheaf, you're just getting these finite points. Um, so it's possible that the equivalents would give a new proof of that, but a very strange way of proving it. I was wondering, actually, when you were computing your injective dimensions and that sort of thing, whether um, the, whether the finite group consideration came in there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think actually this is how you'd prove it. You'd say, well, if it's a finite group, then the um, you're going to be taking a sheaf over a finite discrete space, and well, the, this Cantor-Bedixson process just terminates at stage one, whatever it is, and that tells you that everything is just going to be injective. So uh, a very strange way to prove a result, um, but uh, arguably a generalization to this other case. Okay, any more questions? I wanted to make a comment, and this is probably not appropriate. I'll just make it anyway still. Uh, is it possible, do you think, that this theory could be like vastly generalized to uh, what Dustin Clausen and Peter Scholze call condensed abelian groups? Um, yes, that was on my list to look at. Um, maybe? Yeah. Um, I've got to go make a note to go and have another look at that, because I think that dropped off the thing. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see whether that would work. Um, that means I've got to go remind myself a bit more what condensed uh, group theory is. Yeah. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions for David? Doesn't look like it. Okay, um, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, we do not have a talk the next two weeks as I'll be away in Copenhagen. And the week after that, we have Mark Behrens. So yeah, see you there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks, sir. Bye, -bye.